I have to put that in the bloopers somehow. Gonna... <laughs> what's the, what's in the bloopers? Oh no, like me just talking to the camera about like I've got my phone out. It's oh like, right, right. <laughs> it's like I've got my phone out for good reasons. It's for educational purposes. <laughs> <laughs> how does this affect my learning, sir? <laughs> it's, like, it's like you have to learn how to read, mate. Yeah. <laughs> I bet you put that in. <laughs> oh, no. I've got to put this in. Oh. <laughs> All right. Um, look, I, I'd like to talk about the form. Uh, of the film, um, how it was constructed, uh, because one of the things that I love about the film is one, uh, how it was put together in terms of how they do the revelation of Andy's escape. But at the same time, I kind of want to talk about how Roger Deakins, um, just like the Coen brothers, uses cameras and lenses to kind of change how we see and experience the film and probably one of the reasons why it's a 9.2 on IMDb because it it allows audiences to be part of the cinematic experience. So in first, I think that uh, as a first time viewer, the audience sees Andy as an innocent man, right? We, we're told that he's innocent and we kind of take that for, to at first, at first, uh, at face value. So we as an audience are witnesses of the dehumanization of the prisoners um, and Andy treats the prisoners with humanity. So the, the rooftop scene where he calls his, uh, you know, his, his prisoners, uh, his fellow prisoners co-workers. And even the guards deride that. They go, oh, co-workers, really? He, but, yeah, he's like, that's rich. Yeah, but he gives, uh, he gives... He gives the prisoners a taste of humanity. He gives the prisoners a taste and a reminder of the outside world. The, the, the fact that, you know, like something that was either they took away from themselves or was taken away from them. And... Because in that scene, yeah. the hue changes from a grey hue... To like a gold. A, to like a gold. Yeah. Cause it, and it gives you like this really warming feeling and, and the narration is that like he just wanted to be normal. We could have been mm. tiring the roof of our own homes. Yeah, and one of the things that really surprised me about the film is the fact that uh, when, as the film progresses, we slowly see him, like Andy, get dehumanized and he's getting trodden down by the system to the point where everyone's worried when Andy asks for a length of rope. Now, the entire time we see Andy, you know, working on his escape, but we don't really see his overall progress. So when he asks for a length of rope after being, you know, trodden on again by the system we actually think that oh look you know the system has broken him and like any good prison film he's going to off himself you know that's the tragedy of prison life and everything but um at the end of act two and as we go into act three andy escapes andy escapes and i i love how at that point it's almost like the uh the, the Jesus story of the rolling over the of the stone and then everyone's sticking their heads in they can't find the body and and um, even the the warden says you know hallelujah it's a miracle um, and everyone's doubting you know doubting the whole uh, the escape and I, I, the reason why I, I like talking about um, the Shawshank Redemption in terms of a religious uh, like um, allegory uh, and not necessarily a parable is because the, the cast and crew were non-believers. Uh, Stephen King talks about his atheism a lot. Mm. And so when they imbue this film with Christian uh, symbology, it's either tongue-in-cheek, and I don't really think it's that tongue-in-cheek. I think it is a nod to the idea that, um, you know, hope and, and Christian life or even just religious life mm. can give someone a sense of hope. Mm. But you also have to get that from within yourself. You have to find it within other people. So the entire time, like they, they in that one, at the end of Act 2 in that one scene, they mash all these different, uh, I guess, Christian symbols in there. So like, you know, the, the tomb, then when he throws the, uh, the piece, uh, the, rock, the yes. rock through the poster, yeah. he sticks his hand in as like, you know, almost like the hand in the, the, uh, the, the nail, um, sorry, the the fingers in the hands, the idea that, uh, you know, like the idea of I don't believe it, 
So like, you yeah, know, Jesus yeah, says yeah. to his followers, like, you know, look, look, put your fingers in my hands. You know, these are real holes. Um, and then it's a woman's womb at the front yeah. of the poster. And then as he rips it open, we're, we're falling back into this, this hole. It's, it's just, to me, it's beautiful. And I, I could wax lyrical all about it. And, I, and I'm rambling right now. Yeah, the womb like <laughs> contributes to that idea of a rebirth on the outside. Yeah. Yeah. Although, strangely enough, I also think it's a little bit tongue in cheek that he goes out of the other end, which is the, oh, the uh, it's the surge, yeah, it's a surge yeah, pipe. Yeah. So I, I think, oh, but that's true. And yeah. um, but then he is cle- no, cleaned by nature and everything yeah. and the rain. So it's like a redeeming feature. It's it's one of my little favorite. Like I think it was like the symbology was intentional, mm. and uh, it's kind of. It's kind of like funny, but also uh, I'm in awe of it. Yeah. Because of just how good, and it and it takes the second viewing to actually realize that the film sets you up to believe that Andy's going to kill himself. Yeah. And the film sets you up to believe that Andy has been downtrodden, and the film sets you up into believing that Andy is destroyed because of the death of Tommy. Yeah. Like you know, he 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 took on the sisters. Yeah. And he's fine. You know, he took on the prison system as an innocent man. He's fine. He's stoic. He doesn't say anything. And then Tommy dies. Mm. And then, you know, um, you, you think got, that the world yeah. has ended. And that's what we expect. And I think that's, uh, uh, I think that's what the director really wanted us to go into in the first viewing. And that's what I think is beautiful about the film. And then which brings me to the cinematographer. I think... Sorry, <laughs> just wait. Yeah, please interrupt me if you want, because um, I'm just going to rush through this. Um, one of the things I love about the uh, the character arcs is the fact that because Andy is kind of like this Jesus character, this symbolic Jesus character, or even like an every person character, like you know, take away from the fact that he's like innocent or the fact that he may be guilty and that he's a banker or whatever. Um, I think the reason why Brooks has no hope when he leaves prison is because when he does leave, he doesn't witness Andy's escape. So he doesn't, you know, in, in the in the in the thought of like the resurrection story, he doesn't witness Jesus's uh, resurrection. So uh, Brooks has no hope. Yeah. Mm. And then, but Red does witness his resurrection. I mean, he's in the tomb. Uh, and he realizes that oh my god, like you know, he's not dead; he's actually gone. Yeah, like and Red then does not off himself at the end. He does not die. He actually then, you know, the the final scene, which is like you know, he's on a fishing boat uh, in an endless sea, and Red meets him. This whole idea of like you know the fishermen, fishers of men, and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that. When it comes to these these symbologies in this form, I think that it's one of the reasons why it is both a, a beautiful film uh, for non-believers, but it also reaches out and acknowledges believers as well. Like, um, there's a lot of articles out there that talk about how Shawshank Redemption is one of the greatest uh, Christian films of all time, even though that it was made by non-Christians. Mm-hmm. And I think that's I think that's a beautiful thing. It's it's like a it's like a, a, a strange, like uh, beautiful middle ground uh, between uh, two opposing thoughts. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think I agree with that as well. I, I guess again, it's accessible to everyone. I suppose, like as you were saying, Christians and non-Christians. Um, yeah, what do you think about it? Um, do you want to? Leo, do you want to elaborate on like your why it's like such a great Christian film? Uh, yeah. So from the Christian perspective, the fact that I mean, like, I'm not going to go and and uh, belittle the the symbology of of it. If you ignore the symbology or the Christian symbology used in it, the fact that it is, uh, and I cu- I keep calling it an allegory because um, it it's it's an educational film in terms of like this is the dehumanization of people and we want people to have agency. If you see it as a parable, then it's a parable on um, that everyone who believes, everyone who has hope, has everyone faith. who yeah. has some faith, whether it is based on evidence or not, the idea that you have to have something in your heart 
that can't be taken away, that can't be destroyed. And so therefore you have the opportunity and the chance for redemption. Mm, like something outside of, you have to have something outside of yourself. Yeah. Yeah. It's like, um, I guess, furthering on that, um, you know, universal messages, not just in Christianity, but other religions, you know, uh, you know peace, love, unity, um, you know, really the foundations of religion that can often be forgotten in the everyday, like, occurrences of our lives. Um, these are these are core to, to how we should be living um, and, you know, to our, not only just our morality, but just our um, uh, harmony in a society. Um, and I guess um, you said something earlier... Um, so I, I talk about how like it's it's a, a film that was created by non-believers who use Christian symbology to talk about the human condition. Oh, that's right. Yeah, and and arguably, like I wonder if it's like you know how we were talking earlier about hope and how you know um, uh, what's his name Red get you know has that hope. Mm. I wonder what, what could we substitute the word hope with faith you know and how like you know that generally resonates with christianity is they have hope because they have faith in something wider or you know something you know will come of it um and and i guess echoing what what you know red witnessed is um uh that that sort of you know andy's disappearance gives uh, gives him hope and um faith that a belief that things can succeed for a prisoner. Um, yeah. It's like there, there is a world outside. Mm-hmm. Um, it's almost like, you know, Red's idea of heaven, I guess you could say. Um, now, I mean, like, you know, this, this is a, a film that uses very specifically Christian symbology, but if you take those same ideas, you could place it in any form of faith, any kind of faith. The, uh, even, even faith in friends, faith in a political system, mm-hmm. the idea that you have, like, I mean, we talk about how we need prison reform. We can have faith in that. Um, the, question, the, the difference, though, is that with someone like Andy, he has agency, and the others didn't. And so, in order to, see, to in order to be, I think, in my view, in order to have faith, in order to have hope, you need to have someone to demonstrate that with agency. So, like you know, I might be a good runner, a good sprinter at school, but man, you know, it's like I'm I'm never going to be the best. And then you meet someone who says, who has won a gold medal, and says, "Hey, you could be really good." I mean, that stuff sticks with people. And it may never happen, but the fact is, is that that person has just given you hope. That and person that has given has you faith. faith. In you, yeah. That has faith in you. It may not happen, but then that that increases your agency. That it gives it's you the ability like a to try force, and drive. Yeah. yeah. And so that's that's kind of why I think that um, why I kind of imbue Christian comments throughout all these episodes that we talked about because um, even though that it's a very like it's a secular film it intentionally uses these symbols to kind of communicate something that may or may not be communicable in any other way, perhaps. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I don't know. I'm, I'm not uh, a filmmaker, but the, the symbology there communicate like, the reason why it connects with people, I mean, like, it's 9.2 on IMDb. It's the world's most popular film. Um, there's something there for everyone. So somehow this film reaches out and touches us um, either in a secular or non-secular way, it is it is about humanity at its core. It is about humanization. It is about hope. It is about faith. And um, there there is something else that I think connects with people, and I just don't know what that is <laughs> personally. Did you want to talk about the um, cinematography and the shots? Yeah, yeah. So I'm a big fan of Roger Deakins. Um, his films are amazing. I, I highly recommend that if you watch a film that has Roger Deakins in it, you pay attention to how he shoots because um, in a couple of interviews, he points out that Roger Deakins does not shoot on tele- telephoto lenses. He shoots on wide. Now, for those of you who don't know anything about uh, telephoto and wide-angle lenses, this is an example of techniques. So uh, I'm all about techniques, people. Uh, when you have a camera that is 
over the shoulder or a two shot, um, like these cameras here. Uh, one of these cameras is technically shooting over my shoulder and uh, filming you. So it's it's about maybe say three, four meters uh, away from us. That gives us a sense of like we're spying or we're looking over something. Um, we're, we're distanced as an audience away from this. Uh, but Roger Deakins uses wide angle lenses and he puts the camera in between characters. So we're not looking over someone's shoulder, we're in front of them. So if I was a Roger Deakins, I would have three cameras, one in front of Zoe, one in front of Amanda, and one in front of me. And what that does and what that kind of uh, reinforces is it puts the audience inside the action mm. and it forces us to be part mm. of, like almost like we're another character. Mm, yeah. So when Deakins was uh, hired to do cinematography, uh, he convinced... Uh, Who's the director again? Darabon. Darabon. Uh, sorry. Yeah. So he convinced Darabon to to use his style, and Darabon knows Deacon's style, mm. and because if you had a camera that was like you know looking over the shoulder in the distance over yeah. there, um, it meant that we weren't part of the action, and so we wouldn't feel like these are characters to humanize. They were characters over there, but now that we're inside, ninety nine percent of the shots, almost all of them. Uh, shots that are inside the action. And so we see not only, let's say, your face, but we can also see the Matilda poster in the background. Mm -hmm. We see the cat next to you. Um, and because we're so close, it's very intimate. There's, there's more action and there's also more movement. Whereas like a telephoto lens, you know, you, you can you can get really close, but you you get you don't get that kind of like engagement where if my hand goes forward... Mm -hmm. um, it actually gets really big and things like that towards yeah. the camera. I, yeah. I, you, one thing that you just reminded me of is that scene in the library when they're all like cataloging the books and putting them in, you know, the, in the genres. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, one of the prisoners, I've forgotten his name, he, he's like reading um, one of the author's names and he's like... Um, dumbass. 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 And, and then... Um, uh, red cracks up, and I actually like was I felt like part of that joke because like you felt like you were in the circle yeah, with yeah, the prisoners, yeah, because yeah, yeah, yeah. it was quite like and it I, was yeah, it was just an intimate like funny little yeah. group moment, yeah. you know. And I thought that was that's the thing that those over the shoulder shots, as you're saying, they you know often create a distance. And then if it had been shot using over the shoulder shots it would have been easy for the viewer just to dismiss the prisoners as, like, the other and see them as the other and, like, you know, us and them. But I think um, the those shots, like, where the camera is placed in the middle of um, the scene, um, it serves to individualise the prisoners rather than seeing them as a collective because when we mm. group people together, we become desensitised to their individual personalities, um... I can't remember which philosopher it was, but they were basically, like, they, they gave the example of, like, when you conceptualise something, like, you know, you see a tree, okay? But you're not... Once you, um, you know, once you understand a tree as a concept, you don't then have a look at the individual leaves and you don't see the beauty of the leaves on that tree and that every tree is, like, different in its own way. And so I feel like um, those camera techniques, they really, like contribute to that idea that um prisoners are yeah. individuals it's, it's a more it's also a more human point of view having a wide angle lens because our eyes don't zoom and so when we pick up something and we want to examine something in detail we bring it towards us and if a camera comes closer to you we get that sense of intimacy but the the really fascinating thing about um having a wide angle lens as well is that it, you capture the environment and so once once you read the environment, and we do this naturally, like if I walk into someone's house, one of the, uh, this is this is admitting a little bit too much. Um, whenever I walk into someone's house for the first time, I like judge mine. I judge the house. <laughs> Tell me what you know. I, know so I, I judge I judge the house. I don't know why I do this, but I judge the house based on the bathroom. Oh, okay. So like you know, it's like how clean the bathroom is. It's yeah, right. it's impeccable. On, I love you. I love your bathroom. On. I did a quick the test. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's great. But the thing is that though is that if you have an over the shoulder shot and you have a tele tele like a telescopic zoom, 
um, you can't really see the background. So you can't make judgments on that person. You can't like you, you can't, you can only just see like the blurry background a little bit. But if you have the prison bars, the bricks, you have the bird, you have like the colors and then their clothing, because remember a telephoto lens is usually just the head. Um, here, as you could see, we have some food and it's telling you guys a little bit of information about what's going on oh, here. Oh, okay, so, okay, okay. Whereas this camera on Zoe, it's just got the laptop, the microphone and you and a little bit of the poster. But when, when you have a wide angle lens, it's giving you more information about who they are based on their surroundings. Right. It's one of the reasons about why I love world. Deacons because mm. you don't have to say, oh, you know, she was rich. You just have to see her yeah. hairdo, her dress, yeah. but also mm. the nice couches and the frames and the doors. And so when you have uh, wide angle lenses, you also have framing within frames. You see the bars. Um, and this is just be me being super nerdy now. Brooks is never framed against bars because he's he's going to be free. He's going to be released. As he exits, you know, he's in an oversized suit, but the doors open behind him. He's uh, there's, They try their best to not have bars in front of Brooks, mm. um, whereas everyone else, you know, like they're leaning against the bar and they shoot from that side. Yeah. There's bars in between them and the camera uh, because Brooks is, is trying to be free um, and he's, in, you know, He's free because of, of the bird, but he doesn't want to let go of the fact that he wants to stay in prison. Mm. Hello, cat. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so... I have, I have a question for yeah, you there. Yeah, like, I, I really like this idea. I think it's uh, interesting that that wide angle giving us more information about the character. Like, is there another example you can give us with maybe Andy or, I don't know? Um, yeah, so one of the things that's really interesting about Andy is... Um, when you first meet him and he's being declared guilty, you get his like reaction of, oh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm found guilty. And that's one of the powers of uh, a wide angle lens being right up to your face. But you also see the reaction of everyone behind him. If it was a telephoto lens and it was done like, let's say for television, because, you know, you want everything to be like a play. So everything's over there. Um, if it was for television or any other film or any other director, it would be close up of Andy Dufresne going, oh, I'm, um, I'm guilty, sorry. I'm supposed to be innocent and I'm going to jail. Then it would be cut to audience mm -hmm. yeah. and then audience reaction. But you get that at the same time. Yeah. And so you're feeding that. And uh, another example would be uh, Red as he's telling the story to all the other prisoners. And you have just one guy in the, in the side. Just you know, You don't pay attention to him. But you can see him just like kind of nodding along. And so you get the idea of like who Red is immediately. Mm. Because one, he's telling a story. Everyone respects him. He's being paid attention to and everyone agrees. You don't need someone to say, oh, that's Red over there. He can, you know, mm. he's really popular. Right. It's, you look at that and go, oh, he's got everyone's attention. Um, another example is the warden uh, when he's introducing the... Uh, introducing himself to the new prisoners. You have a wide angle shot of all the prisoners and the camera's further away. And then you have like the, the guards going, you know, you, you maggot, you piece of shit, whatever. And then it's cut to the warden and it's a wide angle shot and he's gigantic. And he says, welcome to Shawshank. Mm. And you know exactly who he is. He doesn't have to introduce himself as the warden. He's just like, welcome to Shawshank. I'm the warden. And, um, I'm the biggest person that you're going to come across. Because the guards are small, the prisoners are small, but the warden's big. And I think that that juxtaposition is what makes, I think, Shawshank uh, and Daldry's, not Daldry, sorry, uh, Deacon's... De Devon? Uh, no, Deacon's... Deacon's uh, cinematography. Yes, oh, Deacon's Deacon's cinematography like, yeah. uh, special. So I've been watching a lot of uh, Daldry stuff because of Billy Elliot. Um yeah, so then with, with a wide-angle frame, you, do, you could do things like frame within a frame. So, the, you know, there's a lots of uh, the camera being inside boxes so to reinforce the fact that you were in a prison. So, oh, yeah, because so I the, guess that's what happens when, like, the safe, they yeah. see, they, po they look through the hole that the Andy's hole. escaped out of yeah. and we get that view of their That very confined, claustrophobic, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. entrapment. And... Uh, 
and it's one of the few times that I mean, the the camera moves a lot, but it's uh, mostly locked down on a tripod. Mm. So you have lots of like conversations where the camera is very still, but it's a uh, it's a pulling away kind of camera movement, um, which which suggests you know like you know. Uh, like Andy's escape but the other times that the camera does move is when it goes into the air mm. um, and we were talking about this earlier the idea and I, I, I disagreed at one point uh, where I thought that I think the aerial shots is is uh, a symbol for freedom the idea that this is Andy's last ex- uh, last uh, attempt uh, last feeling of freedom because we're flying towards the prison and we go over it and the only other time that we see another aerial shot um, are, the, are the last scene and the opera scene, scene. the oh, music and, scene. And the scene where Tommy gets shot as well and he's lying on the ground. Yes, no, that's yeah. true. Yeah, we do get that because so that, yeah. And that's from the point of view of, of the, the prison. Of Had- I, I feel like it was the point of view of Hadley maybe because it was he had just shot Tommy. But yeah. then also it's like mm. directly above, so maybe not. Uh, yeah, I mean, you could argue both because, I mean, it's, it's an... It's an ambiguous uh, camera angle. Right. Aerial shots, you know, are not natural. Yeah, yeah. So we can guess who it yeah. is because there's there's nothing in nature that locks us down unless, of course, you're mm. using a drone. Um, that, like, uh, unless you're a bird because uh, drones are not natural <laughs> technically. <laughs> but the, uh, the idea is that, you know, that symbology is like moments of freedom. Mm. And so I guess you can say that Tommy is free because at least... When you die, you don't have to be in prison anymore, um, which is which is a sad, right, almost okay. cynical kind of way of looking at well, it. Well, I guess if you think, yeah, I guess for him, he was in and out of jail, in and out of jail, all his attempts mm. were futile. Maybe that was his only, like yeah. maybe that is like maybe he was never gonna escape from the prison system. Maybe he was just mm. always gonna go back into keep re- keep reoffending, and yeah. the cycle was just gonna con- going to continue. Or unless you use it as like a... Because I, to take your idea that you told me earlier, um, sorry for putting you on the spot. Oh, that's that one, all right. <laughs> is that if if you had it from the prison's point of view, mm. so then the, the flyover is like, this is the prison. Yeah. And it's, it's almost like its own character. Yeah. That to me is horrifying because mm. then Tommy's death is like the prison just watching with indifference. It's almost like a God character. This whole idea of like... Yeah, I could save you, but I don't care. You're, yeah. you know, you're you're nothing to me. You're ants, yeah. and and so therefore these guards can kill you. Um, yeah, because that's yeah. also the purpose of an aerial shot is to dwarf the subject. Because as yeah. you go up, it's like, and so you could take that interpretation and see him as his death is just really insignificant because he's just like a small like dot on the ground and is that how he's meant to be treated like you know like what is that the film trying to get us to feel like oh my god like he's so insignificant and we're supposed to be upset with that i think it's just highlighting how callous they are with in regards to human life Mm. so what was your like interpretation of the aerial shots earlier well initially when i saw the aerial shots i thought that it was like reinforcing the oppression of the prisoners because the prison is like a panopticon with all the guards surrounding it and they're like all looking in and so I thought it was like more of a this idea that the prisoners are always being like surveilled like everyone can see their every move and there's like no um they can't hide like there's there's no escape like the guards can see everything Mm -hmm. um so that was kind of my interpretation of it initially because they like the initial aerial shot that like pans over the prison like there's this really like ominous music and there's like really gray color because I just got this like off feeling about it mm-hmm. but then I can also see how it's like a symbol of the Andy's last moment of freedom because like the aerial shot of the prison happens as the bus is entering the prison and then it goes into the prison once Andy arrives on the bus if we're looking at the aerial shot as bird's eye view as the other name that it's called mm-hmm. well when red says some birds aren't meant to be caged and that's yeah. andy like he yeah. ha- that we have that aerial shot before mm-hmm. he enters into the jail and then at the end it's like the the film is like bookended kind of by those yeah. almost well we have andy's like trial beforehand but 
Yeah. So are, you, are we are we agreeing that the aerial shots are you know showing that freedom perspective, or did we? Um, I, 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 th- I think you disagree? can. I think you could. The only reason why I disagreed earlier was because I came in with a preconceived notion as to like what it means, but. Mm. I mean, the good thing about English and the good thing about debate is that well, when someone says, debate. this is how I see it, you can actually be like, oh, well, actually, that's a really good idea. And so that's why I wasn't saying it was bad. It was just I disagreed with it at first. And then now I'm using it like, yeah, this is actually a way you can interpret it. Yeah. Because I um, interpret it both ways, like your yeah. way and yeah. my way, yeah. Yeah, depending I on the same. Yeah. legitimate. So if you're a student, there's two paragraphs right there for you. <laughs> you <know? Yeah. laughs> because like the thing about the thing about discussion is that you can actually say, well, some people will see it this way mm. and then some people will see it the mm. other way. And um, and if you're looking for words in your essay, you can do both. Um, but yeah, like to, without being frivolous, the idea of um, the bird's eye point of view or the gods, God, uh, the aerial shot is that it's so rarely used because I think that the the creators want us to feel the oppression. They want us to look at this and go, oh my God, this won't end. Like there's there was only one respite in the middle of the whole film, which is the um, the music scene, the opera scene. And that's the only respite. And that's, that's a beautiful moment because we spend this entire time um, the only other aerial shot that kind of gives us um, the opposite of that is the rooftop scene. Mm. And that rooftop scene where he's where Andy's being held over. But that's that's kind of like almost like a God point of view as opposed to an aerial shot. The idea of like just looking on with indifference. Mm. This is what the prison can do to you. Um, but when the music plays, it really is nice and slow. It's actually not looking down. Mm. It's actually just rising up. So, you, which you is could, interesting because yeah. obviously the music is um, uplifting the yeah. prisoners' spirits, and so that idea that it's rising up is like reinforces yeah. that. So, like when it, when it talks about when I talk about techniques, um, and even though this is just one technique, wide angle lenses, and so two techniques, wide angle lenses and uh, the aerial shot, um, how it's used is is really important. So. The fact that it's uplifting is because the camera is still horizontal and rises up and kind of tilts down slightly, so yeah. then you can see everyone. But it never really truly looks down. Mm. But the only times that you really truly look down is over Tommy's dead body, and uh, you really truly look down when you are watching Andy being held over the roof. And in my view, that is the prison looking on with indifference because it's that kind of God point of view that really unnatural straight down look. Yeah. Uh, and hence the reason why I talk about uh, the, the crew, cast and crew being uh, atheists is because they're injecting that kind of like uh, religious symbology inside. And then when you have like hope, then that's when the camera rises up. So at the very end and uh, the music scene, mm-hmm. because it, you never really truly look down. You just rise up and, and kind of, fly away i guess you could say you know you're not because when when a bird flies away it's not above you it's over there yeah yeah that's interesting um leo i had a quick question about the wide shots earlier um because you mentioned that it allows the audience to be like in the action or part of that Mm -hmm. do you would you say that uh, we're deliberately positioned as the audience to unite with the prisoners or is that like um, I think that that helps with the humanization. <laughs> right. So, yeah. like, you know, we, we're not meant to side with them. That's, that's up to the audience. We're not being forced to side with them. Mm-hmm. Uh, what is actually happening is that you're told straight up that here's an innocent man, apparently, who's been found guilty, is in a prison system, and you meet all these characters. And you might look at that and go, ugh, gross, right? These are all prisoners. And we get our first bit of that kind of uh, predisposition when Brooks asks for the maggot. And we, we make all of our assumptions in one go right there, and it subverts that. It says, no, I'm actually feeding the bird. Mm-hmm. And the fact that the camera is above the table and we're looking back and forth between all the characters, we're not looking over anyone's shoulder, shows us that, one, we're, we're exposed to the idea that here's a character who's supposedly 
uh, an evil character who's doing something that right, yeah, yeah. that yeah. almost anyone can possibly do. Mm. And that is consistent throughout the entire film mm. that uh, every time that the camera uh, sits in front of a, another character, we're not told to... We're not told what to think about it. We're told to judge. Mm. And so based on their actions, we're judging them, not necessarily based on their prison sentence or what they were before. And I think that's one of the reasons why it's, it's beautiful about how they were able to do it as opposed to other prison films. Yeah, that's such an interesting idea that we are judging them on their, on their actions in that moment rather yeah. than what they're... Because yeah, we don't get flashbacks, yeah. you know. Yeah. No. We're just told their story and then we just hear about it from there. Like, uh, the yeah. only, yeah. Because the, you know, Boggs and those prisoners, they're so evil and we would never lump them in with Andy and Red. So, again, it's contributing to that idea of, like, we can't see prisoners as, or as a collective, like, as perpetrators or perpetrators' victims because sometimes the prisoners, like, Andy is the victim and the Boggs is the perpetrator. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah, and and it, and it it just brings it back to this whole idea of like unlike unlike math or science where there is a right and a wrong answer, English is a sea of grey, and you you we go in with our predispositions of prisoners bad, Shawshank subverts all of that and says actually the real answer is sometimes you know mm-hmm. sometimes they're bad yeah. sometimes they're good. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but they're all the time they're still human. Mm-hmm. And like any human, we can all do bad things and we could all do amazing things. Mm-hmm. And I think that that's one of the redeeming qualities of Shawshank is the fact that it teaches us as an audience that we should not go in and see prisoners with our preconceived notions, no matter how hard the media tells us that they are horrible, disgusting people. And yes, they do horrible, disgusting things, but humans do that. We all are capable mm. of doing that. Mm. There's, and um, the warden shows us that uh, anyone is capable of horrific and horrible things. Mm-hmm. Definitely. You've summed it up <laughs> well, the <laughs> message of the film. <laughs> Did you want to talk about the colour scheme, um, Leo? Did I, um, I think we touched on that. Yeah. The colour scheme is pretty much... Um, like it the changes according to the mood. Yeah. Right. Um, right. Okay. And uh, one of the things that's really beautiful about it is that you have this monotone kind of color scheme, but it's it's only really vibrant at the very end. Mm-hmm. I think we talked about that like a couple of sessions ago. So. Yeah. Okay. Like yeah, yeah. My bad. And yeah, but um, yeah, I could talk about color all day. <laughs> so, yeah, 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 and I'm probably going to end it there because that I've I've waxed lyrical long enough. <laughs> all right. All righty. Concluding thoughts or. Oh, that was a good chat, good guys. Yeah, yeah, good, yeah. Chat. good, good chat. To, um, Good interpretations. I love the variety yeah. there. I think it's. Um, I think it's important. I think it's important to have these have these discussions about you know how people see the text and and um, what messages arise from it. Uh, and I think yeah. that's the that's the point of literature. Yeah. Well. Thanks for listening, everybody. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs>